Amen. Amen. Y'all let them know how much you appreciate them leading us this morning. You know, always blessed by them. Psalm chapter 77. Psalm's in the middle of your Bible. Psalm chapter 77. We start a new series this morning entitled, When the Struggle Gets Real. Now, something for every single follower of Jesus to take note of this morning, and that is, just because you're following Jesus does not mean that you will become immune from struggles. Every follower of Christ face difficult days. Read the Old and the New Testament. You'll discover, especially in the New Testament, all of the disciples who followed Jesus had difficulties. They had struggles. Now, the question comes, how do we handle the emotions that hit us whenever those struggles arise? And there are all kinds of struggles uh, that cause all kinds of emotions. But this morning, what I want to do is talk to you specifically about a few emotions known as discouragement as well as depression. Now, when you think about discouragement, what comes to your mind? Discouragement really is, uh, you know, it hits every single one of us. As a matter of fact, it's one of those things that can come upon us whenever something doesn't go the way we thought that it should have went. Discouragement can actually hit us whenever our dreams have kind of faded, whenever uh, not only does something not go the way we desire for it to go, but something goes completely the opposite way that we desire for it to go. And as a result, it discourages our hearts. Discouragement is something that can kind of come on you for about two or three days, all right? So you can have that be kind of moping around uh, in discouragement. But here's the thing. If you and I don't learn to deal with discouragement biblically, discouragement becomes an on-ramp uh, for what we call depression or despair. Now, whenever I mention depression and despair, I'm not talking about clinical depression, all right? I'm talking about depression, though, that can come upon even a child of God. And that person can experience that for longer than two or three days. It's a time frame when all of a sudden sadness and gloom kind of uh, roll up on you like a large blanket. And all of a sudden, every single thing that you see is negative. Every single thing that you experience really just drives into that concept of being in despair, having no hope. And you're kind of to the point where you're thinking, you know, where is God? Does he not care about me? What is his problem? Why doesn't he help? And depression is something that followers of Jesus can actually experience. And so the question that we have to ask this morning is, is there a word for those of us who have these kinds of issues in our life when we are discouraged and even when we are depressed? And the answer is uh, without a doubt. In fact, Psalm chapter 77 is written by a guy named Asaph. Real, real quick, quick. Raise your hands. Have you ever heard of Asaph? Would you slip a hand up? All right, good deal. That was more than me. All right, so I, when I sat down and began to study it and began to look at Asaph, I was like, who is this guy? Asaph. So I had to begin to study to figure out who he was. Asaph was an individual who experienced great depression and discouragement in his life. Matter of fact, the interesting thing is what Asaph did for a living. Listen to this. He was actually a choir leader for Israel. David, the king, gave him that particular position. And so David appointed him to be a choir leader, and he had the role of getting all of the Israelite people together and leading them in worship to the Lord. And that's an amazing profession. But what is even more amazing, possibly even stunning, is that he experienced great discouragement and depression in his life. You can imagine, right? James Dollar, probably the happiest guy you've ever seen in your life. Say amen, right? Most positive guy, the way he is on stage, the same way in the office, right? Sometimes we're like, settle down, you know? But he just loves life. Could you imagine somebody like James Dollar becoming discouraged or depressed? Well, that's what it would be like if you were thinking about Asaph becoming discouraged or depressed. And so we're going to see what Asaph speaks about his depression, and then we're going to see, check this out, how he overcame it or came out of it. And I believe this is going to help people. So here's the deal. If you're here today and you're discouraged, you came to church on an awesome day. If you're depressed, awesome day to be here. If you're here today and you're like, not me, man, I've got it going on. I don't ever experience those kinds of things. Well, here's the thing. I want to equip you with Psalm 77 so that you can help somebody in this fellowship who may be experiencing those kinds of issues in their life. I want to equip you with Psalm 77 so that you can also use the truths that we're going to learn to help people who are outside of this body of believers. Because you know somebody who's discouraged. You know somebody who's depressed. And God's word is here to help them. Somebody say amen. All right, so let's see what Asaph wrote down. Psalm 77, if you'll stand with me in honor of God's word this morning. You've got it there in front of you. Say amen. 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 The Bible says, my voice rises to God and I will cry aloud. My voice rises to God and he will hear me. Which by the way, he's very adamant there. He's, he's gonna hear me. 
Y'all ever been like that when you were praying? All right, verse 2. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. And in the night, my hand was stretched without weariness. My soul refused to be comforted. Notice verse 3. This is a unique statement. When I remembered God, then I am disturbed. When I sigh, then my spirit grows faint. Selah, which by the way, that little word selah, you'll find it throughout the book of Psalms. It just means pause and reflect. Verse 4, you have held my eyelids open. I'm so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of long ago. I will remember my song in the night. I will meditate with my heart and my spirit ponders. And then notice verse 7, will the Lord reject forever? And will he never be favorable again? Has his loving kindness ceased forever? Has his promise come to an end forever? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Or has he in anger withdrawn his compassion? Selah. And then I said, it is my grief that the right hand of the Most High has changed. And then verse 11, I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. Surely I remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your works and muse on your deeds. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God. You are the God who works wonders. You've made your strength known among the peoples. You have by your power redeemed your people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. Selah. And then the waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you. They were in anguish. The deeps also trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth a sound. Which, by the way, wouldn't y'all like clouds to pour out water? <laughs> your arrows flashed here and there. Verse 18, the sound of your thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and it shook. Your way was in the sea and your paths into mighty waters. And your footprints may not be known. And you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Let's bow together. Father, we do thank you for your word. And Lord, I'm so grateful for the book of Psalms. Because in the book of Psalms, we get a glimpse of individuals who face difficulties. But we also, Lord, not only see the transparency of their heart, but we also see the triumph of their life as they learn how to deal with some of the emotions that they had going on. And Father, I know this is going to equip us and help us this morning, so we give this time to you, and that's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. So you go ahead and be seated, all right? So how do we deal with discouragement, despair, depression? Two major steps you can take. We've got these in your listening guide, so jot these answers down, all right? First of all, do not hide your emotions. Don't hide your emotions from the Lord. And then I would also say, don't hide your emotions from those who are your trusted friends in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not hide how you feel. That's one thing when you read through the book of Psalms, you will discover that these individuals were not scared to share about what was really going on in their heart. They were extremely transparent. And that's exactly what Asaph was, especially in the first half of this uh, Psalm 77. In fact, in this first half, what you have here is Asaph describing to us how he feels and also how he feels about the Lord. And it gets pretty strong here as we kind of walk through this doing a little Bible study. All right. So look at verse one. He says, my voice rises to God and I will cry aloud. My voice rises to God and he will hear me. Now, I bought, a, I bought for just a moment. This is the psalmist saying very uh, bluntly. I started off praying regular, but I felt like the Lord wasn't listening. So I got louder. Are y'all with me? There are times in your walk with Jesus Christ, I isn't this true, where you feel like your prayers are hitting the ceiling and falling down. That's how Asaph felt. So Asaph's way to combat that was, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna start shouting to the Lord. He's gonna hear what I have to say. Which, by the way, is a pretty bold joker. Don't you agree? Verse 2 here goes on. The Bible talks about how he prayed all day and all night. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. Notice that word trouble there. It, it literally highlights the idea that he was filled with distress and anxiety. He was experiencing great depression in his life, one scholar notes. And then the Bible says that in his time of trouble, he sought the Lord. And I love that idea of seeking the Lord. Uh, it's a continual action. So he didn't just kind of flippantly throw up a prayer. No, no, no. He's serious as a heart attack about getting hold of God. And so he leans in with prayer over and over and often, seeking after the Lord with all of his heart. And then he prays, not only during the day, but the Bible says he prayed also in the nighttime. He says, my hand was stretched out. <laughs> Listen, you ever got to a point like that in your life when you were praying, you felt like the Lord wasn't listening? So you started praying louder. You still felt like he wasn't listening. So finally, you're just like, I'm just going to lift up my hands now. And I'm going to stretch out. To, don't you see me here? That was Asaph. 
That's how he felt. And he says, without weariness, he had lifted up his hands unto the Lord. And then it's interesting what he says here about this time frame in his life. He says, my soul refused to be comforted. Uh, Real quick, your soul is who you are beyond the physical body. And so he says, my soul refused. It rejected, it rebelled against being comforted. Now, some scholars say that this was actually a remark concerning Asaph's friends who were trying to help him. I don't see that necessarily in the text, but that is what some have denoted, that some friends came along and tried to encourage his heart, but his soul refused it. But I believe really what's happening here is that Asaph is bearing his heart to us in a unique fashion. He's saying, I was discouraged and in despair and depression, and so I called out to the Lord, but even in my prayer, my soul still would not be comforted. That seems kind of awkward, doesn't it? Especially for somebody who is involved in ministry full time. Asaph says, I was doing what I know I was supposed to do. I was calling out. I felt like he wasn't listening, but I'm like, you're going to pay attention to me. And he lifts up his hands, and he's still, even in his prayer, no comfort to his soul. That's what was going on in his life. And then he goes on here in verse 3 and he says, When I remembered God, then I became disturbed. Look at the preacher. Wouldn't wouldn't that be an awesome intro to a sermon? If I came up here and said, Hey guys, I've been remembering the Lord this week and I am disturbed. You'd be like, Preacher's got some issues, right? That's what you. Why is he disturbed? Here's the reason he's disturbed. Everybody listen and say yes. The reason he's disturbed is because he's looking back at his life with the Lord, and he's comparing what it used to be like with how it is now. And so when he looks back, he remembers the time when he walked closely with the Lord, when he was excited to be around the Lord, when his soul was comforted. But now, in his day of distress, he's comparing it, and he's saying, it's not like that anymore. It's completely different. And it's actually leading him down a slippery slope. And that would be true probably of some of you here this morning. Some of you, when it comes to your relationship with the Lord, you don't talk about the here and now. You always point to the past. You don't talk about what the Lord's doing right now in your life. You talk about what it used to be. I remember when. And if you compare your current circumstance with the remember wins, you'll end up like Asaph here. He becomes discouraged because he's like, I remember when God used to be so close and now he seems so distant. Like, where is he? And then he goes on here, right? He says, my spirit grows faint. His spirit here speaks of his frame of mind. The word faint means to feel weak or have no energy. Which, by the way, isn't that true? Whenever you're discouraged and depressed, what do you have? No energy, right? Your frame of mind says, I don't want to do anything. Matter of fact, some people who have depression in their life, what happens is they don't even want to get out of the bed. They just want to kind of stay in the dark, like close the shades, you know, turn off all of the lights, turn down the, the, the noise. Let me just lay here and kind of sulk in my pity. That was my man Asaph. Are y'all hearing me preach this morning or are you like, good grief, what's he talking about? All right, he rolls on here. Notice what he says. He's like, uh, you've held my eyelids open. I like this because he capitalizes the you to let us know he's talking about the Lord. He's bemoaning the fact that God won't give him any sleep. So he's like, all right, are y'all listening? I'm modern, modernizing this. Here I am. I'm in the dark. Shades are down. I don't want anything to do. I, I feel like you're so distant, Lord. I want to sleep. I want to rest. But you won't even let my eyelids close. Give me some sleep. Stirred up, my man, Asaph. Bless his heart. He goes on here and says, uh, I'm so troubled I cannot speak. I said that in a funny accent, didn't I? I just heard myself. In other words, he's saying, uh, Lord, you won't, even, you won't let me sleep. But I, I've been praying, but now I don't even know what else to say. In verse 5 and 6, I've considered the days of old, the years of long ago. I will remember my song in the night. I will meditate with my heart and my spirit ponders. He's saying again, I remember what it used to be like. I used to sing at night songs of thanksgiving to you, but not now. Not now. My soul is in despair. One commentator said it like this, quote, he could look to his past and see the goodness of God, which is why his current trouble was so perplexing. I remember when God, God was so good then. What is his problem now? 
That's where Asaph is. Then he kind of gives us all these little, what I call feeling statements, right? Most guys aren't real big fans of sharing their feelings, but Asaph uh, put it out on the table. And uh, I'll just kind of give them to you in seven quick little statements here. Here's how he felt. First of all, he felt like the Lord had pushed him out. So he's like, the Lord, I think he's pushed me away. He writes it there in verse seven. Will the Lord reject forever? And then he also feels like uh, he isn't pleased with me. Maybe God just isn't pleased with what I've got going on right now in my life. He says there in verse 7 again, and will he never be favorable again? And then he felt this way. He turned his back on me. Which, by the way, you ever felt like that, you know, considering God? I just feel like he's turned his back on me. I've had people say that to me. That's how they felt of the Lord. That's how Asaph felt. Look at verse 8. He says, as his loving kindness ceases forever, and the word loving kindness speaks of the loyal love of God. And he's basically saying here, I feel like the Lord's love, it is completely run out, right? I've come to the end of it. There is no more. That's how he felt inside, like the Lord had turned his back on him. And then also, I feel like he's abandoned me. Verse 8 again, has his promise come to an end forever? His promise, by the way, was to be with Asaph to comfort him in his times of need, and now he's not experiencing that. So what does he say? He's like, Lord, has your promise come to an end? Are you not keeping promises anymore either? That's how he's rolling out here. Here's another feeling statement. I feel like he slammed the door on me. You ever had the door slammed on your face before? I have. I've told you guys when I was in college, I was a repo man. And so I would go to homes and uh, take stuff that they weren't paying for. I worked at Aaron's Home Rental. Are you all with me? Now, in that day, I wasn't near as massive as I am now. All right, so I was 6'4", 145 pounds is what I weighed. I weigh 185 now. To God be the glory. (laughs) But I'll never forget. I knocked on some doors, and they would open it, and sometimes I would say, I'm here to get, and before I could get get out, they would slam the door. And and I'm a good guy. Why are you going to treat me like that? Asaph says, I I, I feel like I'm... I'm knocking on the door of heaven, and he's opening it, and then he sees me, and he slams it. (laughs) This dude leads worship. And this is how he feels about the Lord. And then verse 9 teaches us just another feeling statement. Uh, I feel like he doesn't even care. He goes, has he in anger withdrawn his compassion? It gives the imagery of God snatching away his care for Asaph. So Asaph says, I I don't feel like he has slammed the door on me. I feel like he just doesn't even care about me. And listen, I've had people literally tell me, eyeball to eyeball, they've said to me, they said, Levi, this is going on in my life. I just feel like the Lord doesn't even care anymore. That's how Asaph felt. Some of you here today, that's how you feel. You came to church, and I know you kind of got your church face on, but reality is, you know deep down this is how you feel about the Lord. And you're like, I don't even know if he hears me. I mean, I'm a calling. I don't feel like he cares. I feel like he slammed the door. And then the last feeling statement here, I feel like he's gone out of business. You see this in uh, verse 10. It is my grief that the right hand of the Most High has changed. Eugene Peterson paraphrases this verse by writing it like this. It's just my luck. Now check this out. This is a pretty cool little statement. It's just my luck. The high God goes out of business just when I needed him. <laughs> look, look, at me, look at me. Eyeball to eyeball, straight up. Quit trying to act all religious here. Some of us have felt this way before. And if you were to say, uh, Levi, have you ever felt like this? I would say, without a doubt, more than once, I have felt the same exact way when I've called out to the Lord and I feel like he's not paying attention. Matter of fact, um, when I begin to think about emotions here, especially the emotion of um, discouragement, despair, depression, there are some common ways that people deal with that. And uh, let me kind of give these to you very quickly. One way that people deal with that, they bottle it up. So we bottle it up. We like stuff it in. We don't share how we're really feeling. We don't get it out there on the table, right, so to speak. We don't share it. Not only only do we not share it with the Lord, we don't share it with other followers of Jesus who love him and love us. So we kind of hide that. We bottle it up. And then secondly, sometimes we blow up, don't we? So, So we feel like, okay, we feel like the Lord's distant. For some reason, he's not paying attention. I don't know what the deal is with him. And uh, it kind of drives us to a point of despair. And then we begin to lash out at other people in our lives. Hey, ma'am, it could be that your husband's lashing out to you, not because he's ill at you, but because he's got a problem with God. It's blowing up. And then sometimes uh, we isolate ourselves. We isolate ourselves whenever we have these kinds of emotions. And this is uh, very true, especially in Baptist life, right? 
In Baptist life, we're not allowed to tell people that we're discouraged. In Baptist life, we're not allowed to tell people that we feel depressed. We're down, right? If we say that, there's this temptation of pride in our life. If we bring that up, what are people going to think about us? They're going to think we're not really spiritual. We're not walking. walking with. They're going to think we've got issues. Hey, newsflash, you do have issues. Everybody has them. Are y'all listening? Every single one. And, and the thing is, whenever we isolate ourselves, we pull away from God, and then we begin to pull away from God's people. And here's the amazing thing. God expresses his love to us in the community of believers as people serve you, pray for you, minister to you. But if you isolate yourself from the people of God and you don't share what's really going on, you're not going to experience the love of the Lord because you pulled yourself out of it. And this is massive. I've seen this in church uh, a million times. Ever, when I first started preaching, I remember seeing this, right? Whenever somebody was having some issues in their life, I remember seeing people who would sit near the front of the church and they'd be like, preach it, Levi. Oh my goodness, I love what the word says. Are y'all with me? And then all of a sudden something would happen in their life. They'd have a little struggle. And a couple weeks later, they would have moved back about five or six seats. I'd be like, hey man, what happened to you, man? Why you, you used to be down here in the front. Oh, man, it's all right, bro. I'm just kind of hanging out here. I want to see it from this angle. You ain't fooling me. And then I preach a few weeks later, they're sitting on the back row. I'm not trying to point any of you people out. You know what I'm saying? I'm just trying to make a statement about what I've seen. And what are they doing? They're pulling out. You know what they do? They pull out from small group Bible study. They pull out from community groups. They pull away, and they create an excuse about it. They find somebody to blame for their situation. It's always somebody else's fault. No, no, no. The issue is you got a problem with the Lord, and you need to talk about it. But when you isolate yourself, you pull yourself away from the Lord. Next week, all you in the back, y'all going to be in the front, aren't you? Amen? One said no. You don't care, do you? He's like, whatever, preacher. Here's the last thing. All right, jot this down. This is also how we act. Sometimes we indulge our flesh. Now, this is interesting, right? When people have depression or discouragement in their life, oftentimes they'll indulge their flesh to dull their minds and their hearts. In other words, I've got this issue going on with the Lord. I feel depressed. I feel discouraged. I don't know what to do with it. And so sometimes people will say, well, I'm just going to kind of uh, try to zone out. And they choose all kinds of methods of zoning out. So they may choose alcohol, right? They, they may choose internet pornography. Uh, they may choose indulging on social media. They may just, you know, veg out in front of the television, right? And they just sit there for days. What are they, what, what are they doing? They're trying to dull their mind. Which, listen, by the way, you can drink all weekend and wake up Monday with the same problems. They ain't going to help you. But people indulge, don't they? Are are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Because I I really want y'all to lean in. I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this. When you have this kind of problem in your life, discouragement or depression, do not hide it from the Lord or other people. Matter of fact, I hope some of your community groups this morning, when you leave here and go to one, I hope when you get in there, somebody raises their hand and say, hey, you know what? I've just got to share. Here's what's really going on in my life. Here's what's really happening. Here's the struggle that I'm really experiencing. And here are the emotions that come along with it. And then I, I, I'm, I'm praying that that will happen in your small group. And then people will rally around you to lift you up to the Lord in prayer. To be there. Listen, listen. If we're not doing this in community, what are we doing? Are we really just kind of getting around each other and trying to, you know, see who can say the most Bible verses? Are we really here trying to figure out how theologically deep you are? No, man. We're here walking with Jesus, and we all have struggles. And whenever we get transparent about that and share it, God begins to work. That's what I love about my man Asaph. At least he would share it, man. I mean, good night. He wrote it down, didn't he? We're reading it today. All right, so what do we do with it? And this is what I love, how how Asaph turns the page here and begins to uh, actually experience some victory in his life. And it's just step number two. So step one, don't hide your emotions. Step two, get lost in the redemption story of the Lord. 
Now, I got to go quick here, all right, because I see that my time's running out. But here's what I want you to see, okay? Verses 11 all the way through 20 is a page turner in the life of Asaph. Asaph was looking back, and I want you to listen closely to this statement. He was looking back at his walk with the Lord and comparing it to how it was now, and it led him to further despair. But in verses 11 through 20, he looks back now at the redemption story of the Lord in the Exodus. He points back to a time frame when Israel was in bondage to Egypt. And then he talks about how the Lord brought about redemption. He purchased them out of that slavery, and then he brought them towards the promised land. But on the travels there, they stood before the Red Sea, and they had nowhere to go. The Egyptian army changed their mind. They said, we don't want you to leave. We're coming back to get you. So they began to charge in. Now there's a problem. And so it was in this particular moment, and I, I love how um, Asaph describes it here. Look with me at verse 16. He says, the waters saw you, O God. He's talking about the Red Sea waters. And the waters saw you, and they were in anguish. The deeps also trembled. Look at the preacher. Let me translate. The waters looked up at the Lord, and they said, uh-oh. We're fixing to be in for it. And you know what the Lord did? He sent a whirlwind, he separated the Red Sea, and he led his people into victory towards the promised land. Why is Asaph looking back on this story of redemption? He's looking back on this story of redemption, not comparing his current circumstance. Listen closely. Instead, he is looking back at the power and the majesty of God, and he is now anticipating and dreaming about what God can do in his life again. Now, come here. I don't have a slick way to say this, so you'll be like, holy cow, that was deep. I just want you to hear it like this. When he looked back, he didn't look back comparing. He looked back, and it filled him with anticipation. He looked back at the redemption story of God, and he thought to himself, if God can do that, there's no way he'll leave me hanging here. And here, here's the thing. You and I don't look back at the Exodus story of redemption. New Testament you and I look back to the Calvary story of redemption. And I love it. Whenever Timothy was discouraged in his walk with the Lord, Paul the Apostle wrote to him in 2 Timothy, and here's what he said to him. I want you to remember Jesus Christ risen from the dead. Why, why is he saying that to discourage, depress Timothy? Because he knew if he would get his eyes focused on the redemption story, he would begin to experience victory once again. Listen, in the Old Testament, they brought them out of Egyptians' bondage. God did. God brought them out of Egyptians' bondage. New Testament, God brought you and I out of sin's bondage. That's what he did. He redeemed us, brought us back. Jesus died on the cross for our sin, was buried and raised again. There is power in his name. Right? And when we look back at that, it renews our hope. Now, eyeball to eyeball. Here we go, all right? I only got a few minutes. So this is now when pastor shares his heart. With you. Are you listening? There have been times in my life when I've been discouraged in ministry. Matter of fact, a bunch of times. Typically, I am extremely discouraged in ministry when I feel like God didn't do what I thought he should have done. Y'all don't look spiritual on me. There have been times that I preached hard and I thought everybody and their mama should have got saved. And nobody did. And I could walk out of this place with my head hung low. There have been times I've been in meetings, and the meeting didn't go the way I thought that it should go, and I've become discouraged. There have been times I never talked to a pastor on Monday. Are y'all hearing me? Unless you really got a problem. You, you know what I'm saying? Because typically that is the day when discouragement begins to set in. Depression begins to set in. Most ministers of the gospel fill out their resignation letter on Monday morning. Discouraged, depressed. So I've experienced this in my life, so how do I combat this? It's interesting. I, I look back to the redemption story of the Lord. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I look back. I, t I share the gospel with myself all the time. Not so that I can get saved again. I'm already saved. I just share the gospel with myself so I can just be reminded of the power of Jesus. Jesus died for me. He was buried three days later. Good night. They rolled the stone away. Boom. He was raised again. That's who I serve. And, and, and listen, I began to think, if God would give me the very best from heaven in his son, why would he leave me hanging now? So I began to, there have been times I've uh, 
literally gotten up from my desk in ministry after being, um, after fighting with discouragement and depression, that I just got up and here's what I said. I'm going to go find some lost people and share Jesus with them. I got to go. So I'll go find somebody who's lost and I'll share with them the redemption story of Jesus. Why do you do that, Levi? Because it fires me back up again. There's something about going back to the redemption story of Jesus that renews our passion, refocuses us on what God's really called us to do. So check this out. I got to share with the lady who cut my hair this past week, which by the way, nobody said a word about my hair. Does it not look good? So I got my hair cut, right? And I've already shared the gospel with her before on uh, more than one occasion. And so I prayed going in, Lord, open the door, give me an opportunity to share the gospel with her. So we started talking about Thanksgiving Day. So I just said, y'all got any traditions at your house, what you guys do? Well, she shared a little bit. I said, do y'all ever do the corny thing and kind of go around the table and everybody shares what they're thankful for? She says, well, you know, we've done some stuff like that before. We've shared this, that, and the other. I said, well, you know, it's not that we don't have something to be grateful for, right? She said, oh, yeah, definitely. We've got a lot of things to be grateful for. I said, the question is, who are we going to be grateful to? I said, y'all with me? It just got real, right? And then as I looked at her, I said, aren't you thankful for your health? Oh, yeah, I'm thankful for my health. Who do you say thanks to? <laughs> Here, here's her. These are my scissors. You listening? Yeah. She's cutting my hair. She's holding it. And then she looks in the, the mirror. I know where you're going with this. <laughs> it's like, you got that right. I come up out of there, man. I'm on cloud nine. I'm like, listen, that's where it's at right there. Sharing Jesus. Here's what I want to say to you. If you're discouraged this morning, go find a lost person and share Jesus with them. I dare you. Y'all ain't listening to me preach. Because I know what you're thinking. What would I say? Go tell them how to be saved. If you've given your heart to Christ, tell them. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you're redeemed, you ought to say so. Tell somebody. You're going to be shocked and how that just all of a sudden changes your perspective on things. Matter of fact, uh, let me give you this. I got to go. Y'all with me, yeah? I mean, seriously, are y'all with me over here? I don't feel like y'all are. I don't feel like you even care about me right now. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Look, look, look. Charles Haddon Spurgeon faced depression all the time in his life. Charles Haddon Spurgeon is the most quoted preacher on the planet. I read about his struggle with depression on multiple occasions. One article about his depression says this. One evening at Surrey Hall, where he was preaching, it was capable of holding 12,000 people. There was an overflowing crowd with 10,000 people outside seeking to listen to Spurgeon preach. Charles Spurgeon began to stand up. He said a word of prayer, and in the midst of his prayer, some malicious individuals in the crowd shouted, Fire! The galleries are giving way. And immediately, there was great panic in the room. Everyone began to flood towards the exit gates. And as they ran, many were trampled. And after it was over with, Charles Haddon Spurgeon looked out into the empty crowd and saw lying on the floor seven individuals who had been trampled to death and saw 28 others who needed medical attention. And the article said Charles Haddon Spurgeon was so undone over this moment they literally had to carry him from the pulpit and they took him to a friend's house in which he stayed for several days in a deep deep depression later after coming out of this depression Spurgeon writes this perhaps never a soul this is amazing little statement here. Perhaps never a soul went so near the burning furnace of insanity as I did and yet came away unharmed. How did he come away? I mean, how did he get, how did he get out of this? This is how he got out of it. He focused his attention on Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 records for you and I the redemption story of Jesus. Charles Haddon Spurgeon came out of his depression by looking back at the passage of Scripture that says, and the Father gave him a name which is above every name, 
that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. When he embraced the gospel, God renewed his passion and brought him out of that discouragement. So what am am I saying to some of you? Here's what I'm saying. Some of you need to share with somebody what you got going on. I had a friend in ministry not long ago call me on the telephone. He's been in great depression and discouragement. Didn't even know what was going on. Hadn't heard from him in several weeks. And Anyway, he had called and began to share with me what was going on. And here's a statement to him. He said, Levi, I I started thinking about suicide, killing myself. This, this, listen, this, this cat's preaching. I mean, he's a preacher. So he's like, I really thought about killing myself. And, and, you know, I hadn't heard from him in weeks. And I said, well, I want you to know something. I am highly ticked off at you right now. Right? I get, they teach you that in seminary to talk like that. You know what I mean? I'm real ticked off. He said, what, what's wrong? I said, I'm ticked off because you hadn't shared this with me. I said, we've talked so many times. Why wouldn't you bring this stuff up? Why are you isolating yourself? trying to deal with this situation on your own. God's not wired you for that. Here's the thing. When my man began to share what was going on, not hiding his emotions, and going to trusted followers of Jesus in his life, and then he began to focus back on the redemption story of Jesus, God's brought him out. And right now, this morning, in about 45 minutes, he'll stand up and preach again. What... Some of you are discouraged, depressed, down, despair. You need to talk to somebody. You feel it, you share it, then you deal with it. Amen? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for our time together in the Word this morning. Pray that you would speak to hearts right now. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Some of you are here today and you can't get lost in the redemption story of Christ because you've never come to know Jesus personally. So I just want to encourage you right where you are just to give your heart to Jesus. Listen, God made you to know him, but what separates you from the Lord is sin. You know, we've all sinned and fallen short of God's standard. And the payment of our sin is death. We deserve to die, but Jesus, thankfully, over 2,000 years ago, I mean, he died for our sins. He died for us in our place. And then he was buried and raised again. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this morning, if you don't know him personally, you can before you leave here. Penalty of your sin completely wiped away. You can give your heart to Christ. I want to encourage you to do that right where you are. If you don't know the Lord, just call out to him and say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner, and today I want to be forgiven. So I'm turning from my sin and placing my trust in you, Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for the resurrection. Now help me to live a life set aside for your namesake. And with your heads bowed, your eyes closed, if that's the prayer of your heart and you've given your life to Christ today, first step of obedience is baptism. We're celebrating that in our next service. We'd love to set up an opportunity for you to be baptized in the days ahead. So when we stand to our feet in a moment and begin to sing, just leave the place where you've been seated this hour. You come forward, and we'd love to pray for you, help you along on your walk with Christ. Or God may be calling you to join this church body. If that's the case, you'd be obedient as well. We'll give you praise for it. Father, we're so thankful uh, for who you are. We'll give you the invitation and trust that you'll work as you see fit. In Jesus' name, amen.